Father, we're grateful for your faithfulness and we're grateful for the fact that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and your word does not change. And so I just pray you'll be with us today, uh, both in Sunday school and the main service that follows, that you would use our time uh, together to really edify your people in what matters, um, eternal things. And so I pray you'll be with me as I try to teach and bring the right words to my mind that need to be spoken. But we ask in all things that you be glorified. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. If you could locate in your Bibles the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 10. Um, on this uh, last uh, Sunday of January, can you believe that? So we're um, involved in the middle of this uh, Bible study on the whole concept of the rapture. And we have taken a, taken a look in part one of the study on what is the rapture. And we've given you 10 characteristics of the rapture. And then we moved into part two, when is the rapture? Meaning, when is the rapture going to take place, you know, relative to the seven-year tribulation period? And we've given you seven reasons why we believe that the church will be raptured to heaven before the tribulation period even starts. And then from there, we got into the whole subject of strengthening the case, because there's a lot of other passages that we didn't have a chance thus far to deal with. And so there's many other verses that lend support to this view that we're teaching, and so we walked our way through all of those. And um, now we're kind of at the point in the study where we're looking at, well, what do the, the opposing views teach? So we talked about mid-trib. Uh, these are folks that believe we're going to be raptured halfway through the tribulation period. And we've kind of looked at their arguments and responded to them. And what, we're, what we started the last couple weeks is post-tribulationalism. Um, just to be clear, our view at Sugarland Bible Church is pre-pre. Pre-tribulational and pre-millennial. I don't even eat post-toasties uh, anymore for breakfast, pre-pre. Um, uh, but this particular view is pre-millennial, meaning Jesus is going to come back to the earth before the millennium starts, but post in the sense that the church is going to go through the whole tribulation period. So it's a very popular view out there. If you look at it on chart form, it's the second one from the bottom. And we were in the process of, I was giving you their five major arguments and showing you how to respond to those. Four of which I think we've already covered. But they try to connect Paul's last trumpet with the trumpet in Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. And I tried to show you that that in Matthew 24, 30 and 31 is a totally different trumpet. They try to connect the rapture teaching to Revelation 19, but Revelation 19 is a totally different situation also, because in that situation, Jesus is coming down from heaven to the earth. The rapture is the opposite. The church is being caught what? Caught up. They like to point out the fact that the rapture is a resurrection, which it is. As I like to say, it's you get your airlift and your facelift all at the same time. Pretty good deal. Should this happen in our lifetime, which I hope it does. And so what they do is they try to find uh, resurrection in the book of Revelation and basically what they say is, well, the resurrection is spoken of at the end of the tribulation period. So therefore, the rapture is going to be at the end of the tribulation period. And so we went through that argument, and I tried to show you that that res resurrection spoken of 
in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6, concerns the dead only. The rapture, when it occurs, concerns the living, which would be us, if this happens in our lifetime, the living and the dead. And the last time I was with you, we were talking about the fact that one of the key arguments that's used, number four, is yeah, the church is going to go through this time period, but she's going to be supernaturally protected in the midst of it. So that's how they put the church in the tribulation period, and they try to make it work with God's promises that were exempted from divine wrath. In other words, how could I go into a time period of God's wrath and God keep his promise to us that we're exempted from his wrath? Well, they just say, well, God, you know, puts like miracle bubbles, I guess, around us. And so we're exempted from all of the judgments that are hitting the world. And we said, well, if that's what God does in the book of Revelation, he doesn't do a very good job of it because mass quantities of believers are going to be executed during this time period. Who are those believers? Those are people that come to Christ after the rapture. And it will not be easy on them at all, many of whom, I would say most of whom, not all, will be killed. So once you start to see that, that whole argument that people are protected in the midst of the tribulation, that starts to dissolve And this was something I threw in at the very end, and I did it so fast you may not remember. So let me just repeat this. The promises of God to you as a New Testament Christian, it's not just the promise that you'll be shielded from his wrath. I mean, that's a wonderful promise. But the promises are broader than that because what he promises us Here in Revelation 3 verse 10, as he's speaking to the church at Philadelphia, is you will be protected from the hour of these things. So notice Revelation chapter 3 verse 10, and we've done, I think, two major lessons on this in our study. So if you're unconvinced that this is a rapture passage, I would encourage you to go back and take a look at what we said way back when. But Jesus says to the church of Philadelphia, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the wrath of God. It doesn't say that, does it? I will keep you from the hour of testing, that which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So you'll notice here that this isn't even a promise that I'll be protected from divine wrath. Other parts of the Bible do make that promise. But you don't just have a one-fold promise from God. You have a two-fold promise from God. You have a twofer, so to speak. A, there's the promise that you're shielded from his wrath. But that's not what's being mentioned here. Here, what's being spoken of is that you're protected from the time or the hour in which these judgments will transpire. So if that's true, then the whole discussion of if we go into it, will we experience God's wrath or not, um, that whole argument disappears because the promises are broader than I'm just going to be protected from his wrath. The promise is such that we are going to be protected or kept out of the time when all of these things happen regardless of one's position concerning when the wrath of God actually starts. Now, I believe the wrath of God starts right away in the tribulation. Others don't. Mid-tribs don't. Um, Other groups that we'll get into in our study don't believe that. And so they get into this big discussion about when the wrath of God starts. But the fact of the matter is that whole discussion is irrelevant because the promises of God are not just that you're kept from his wrath. The promises are you're kept from the time or the hour in which these things will transpire. So if that latter promise is true, we can't be in any of the tribulation, regardless of your view of when the wrath of God starts in that seven-year period. 
So Charles Ryrie puts it this way. He says, however, the promise of Revelation 3 verse 10 not only guarantees being kept from the trials of the tribulation period, but being kept from the time period of the tribulation period. The promise is not, I will keep you from the trials. It is, I will keep you from the hour of the trials. But how clear and plain is the promise, I will keep you from the hour of testing. Not just from any persecution, but from the coming time that will affect the whole earth. And then he says, the only way to escape worldwide trouble is not to be on the earth. Amen? And not just from the events, but from the time of the events. And I underline this last sentence of his. He says, the only way to escape the time when the events take place is not to be in a place where time ticks. Right? The only place that meets those qualifications is where? It's in heaven. Uh, Ron Rhodes um, has written some wonderful things on this subject, and he says the post-tribulational view, which is the view we're critiquing here, expressed in the writings of George Ladd and Robert Gundry, now I'll give you some Ladd and Gundry quotes in just a minute, and others is the view that, that Christ will rapture the church after the tribulation period at the second advent. Of Christ. This means that the church will go through the time of judgment prophesied in the book of Revelation. But believers will be kept from Satan's wrath during the tribulation. There's a lot of gamesmanship that's taking place in this whole discussion concerning when the wrath of God starts. Mid-tribs say the wrath doesn't start until the second half. Um, there's another group out there which we'll be getting into a few weeks down the road called pre-wrath rapturism. And these are folks that basically teach the wrath of God doesn't start until roughly the final 25% of the tribulation. Not exactly, but roughly. And all of their charts have the rapture taking place in the second half. So I, I call them the, kind of the medium well done crowd. And so they, they, they devote all of this energy to talking about when the wrath of God starts. And although I believe that the wrath of God starts right away, the point that Ron Rhodes is making and Charles Ryrie is making is the whole conversation is irrelevant because Jesus didn't just promise to shield us from his wrath. He promised to shield us from the time or the hour in which these things will occur. So Ron Rhodes, completing this quote, says, pre-tribulationalists such as myself respond, however, that Revelation chapter three, verse 10, indicates that believers will be saved out of or separated from the actual time period of the tribulation. One more quote from uh, Norm Geisler. And he correctly says here, in context, the statement about being saved out of the time of trial does not mean saved, uh, the time of trial does mean saved from it, not through it. One cannot be saved from an entire hour by being any part of it. So just sort of keep in mind that the promises of God to you are such that not only are you shielded from his wrath when these judgments take place, which to me is enough of a promise, but you're actually shielded from the hour or the time in which these things will occur, which means you as a, a blood-bought, born-again Christian and a member of Christ's church can't be present for any of it. That doesn't mean that this side of the rapture, your life is easy. You experience all kinds of persecution from Satan, from the world, from man. But there is a form of persecution that you're exempted from, divine wrath. That's what you're protected from. And not only are you protected from that, you're 
guaranteed by Jesus Christ himself, who cannot lie, that you won't even be present in the time period in which these things occur. So you'll notice that in post-tribulationalism, you know, they don't really interact well, you know, with this, uh, this particular point. So that was my introduction. How's that for a long-winded introduction? Let's get to what we wanted to talk about today, which is the fifth and the final argument of post-tribulationalism, and that's the church history argument. And anytime you engage anyone in a discussion about the rapture, the pre-trib rapture, and they are an opponent of the pre-trib rapture, inevitably what they're going to start talking about is church history. So the argument goes like this. The post-tribulational rapture position has been the dominant view held by theologians throughout the history of the church. They, they kind of phrase it this way. They say, well, the post-trib view is the view of antiquity. And you hear that, and it kind of takes you back a little bit, you know, like, ooh, the view of antiquity. Like, gosh, I better not mess up with tradition. Uh, who, who am I to disagree with the great sages of the past? So here's George Ladd, a post-tribulationalist, and he says, every church father who deals with the subject expects the church to suffer at the hands of the Antichrist. And the prevailing view is post-tribulational premillennialism. Close quote. So his study of church history is that every church father you look at is basically post-trib. The church is going to go through the tribulation period. But at the same time, they're premillennial, meaning after that time period, Jesus is going to come back, rescue the church, and set up his kingdom. So you notice that George Ladd here anchors his case in the church fathers. Uh, here's another quote from Robert Gundry, and he says, Until Augustine in the 4th century, the early church generally held to a premillennial understanding of biblical eschatology, and it was post-tribulational. So the basic claim that's being made here is all of the church fathers said we're going to go through the church, we're going to go through the tribulation period before Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom. Now, I just think it's very interesting here that they want to devote the discussion to church history. And if they get you talking about church history, what are you not talking about anymore? You're not talking about what the Bible says. So suddenly, it's not what the Bible says as the final source of all authority, as the final court of authority in all matters of faith and practice, they've, they've done a kind of a magician's trick on you. They've gotten you wrapped up into a whole conversation about church history. And most Christians, when they get into a conversation about church history, they're kind of caught flat-footed because most churches don't really teach anything about church history. And so most Christians don't know anything about church history, very little. And so they're kind of caught off guard by this uh, church history argument. But it sounds so good. You know, how could these people be wrong? It's, um, you know, a good magician uh, is you don't watch what he's doing with the hand you can see, right? You're always watching what he's doing with, with the hand off, off scene, because that's where the deception is taking place. He's doing something with his other hand. So essentially what's happened with people is it's like a magician's trick. Uh, they've gotten you talking about church history, which is not your forte. And once you start doing that, you're no longer talking about the scripture. So what would I say to this and a view of antiquity argument? Let me give you some responses. Now... Some of this we covered in the first question, what is the rapture? And I gave you 10 characteristics of the rapture. And the 10th point was a, the rapture is a traditional doctrine that's now gradually being recovered. 
So when we dealt with that in one of our early lessons, you know, a lot of this church history stuff um, we went through. So some of this, if you've been tracking with us in our series, some of it is kind of um, review. But two post-tribulationalisms appeal to antiquity. Here are three responses, which I'd like to talk you through this morning. The first response is this. The issue is not when the view became popular. The issue is, is it taught in the Bible? Now, I think if you get into that latter conversation, we win. But if you get into a whole discussion about the sages of the past, we lose. Um, because it is true. Uh, our view, you know, really wasn't very popular for many, many centuries. But I want to show you something, that this was the identical argument used against Martin Luther in the Protestant Reformation. We all know about Martin Luther, 16th century, how he rescued the church from Roman Catholic tradition doctrinally in five areas. These are called the solas of Christendom. These are doctrines that we take for granted today, but Luther had to fight this out back in the sixth century when he took his stand against Roman Catholicism. So those doctrines, and these all have Latin expressions, sola means alone, solus Christus, Christ alone, sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola scriptura, our authority comes from the scripture alone, and sola deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. Now we, sitting in an air-conditioned uh, building in the 21st century, we just kind of yawn and we take all these doctrines for granted, like, oh, you know, so what, let's move on. But the fact of the matter is these were lost to Christendom. Uh, and it, it, it was the calling that God put upon Martin Luther and the Protestant church reformers, many of whom lost their lives in the process, to restore these doctrines. And so that's where the whole Protestant movement came from. It came from Luther rejecting church tradition and standing completely on the authority of the word of God. So one of my favorite Luther quotes is as follows, and Luther had a debate with an individual named Dr. Eck, who was a Roman Catholic apologist. And something else to understand is Luther himself was Roman Catholic. Luther had no intention to start a Protestant movement. Uh, he wanted to reform the church from within and when he posted his 95 thesis on the cathedral door in Wittenberg, Germany, and I've, I've been there and stood there and seen that exact door. Of course, they've redone it, of course, and the city has uh, kind of been commercialized. You can even get Martin Luther socks when you go there. I have a pair, I, I should have worn them today. It's on the bottom of the socks, it says, here I stand, I can do no other. And so whenever I need a little courage, I'll put those socks on. Maybe I should have worn them today. But Luther, you know, when he posted that, he, didn't, he had no idea that he was starting a war on these solas. He thought, it's kind of like on Facebook, you post something to get a conversation started. That's what Luther thought he was doing. And when he started getting called a heretic uh, by the Roman Catholic authorities and actually was kicked out of the church, I mean, that shocked him more than anything else. And so we're, we're basically Protestants today because they basically gave Luther, you know, the, as we like to say, the right foot of fellowship. Uh, they basically kicked him out. But Luther was Catholic all the way. He had no intention to leave Roman Catholicism. The idea of a Protestant church was, a, was an unknown thing in his mind. His training was as a Roman Catholic priest. So Luther is, to recover these solas, is standing totally on the authority of the Word of God with Dr. Eck. In this debate, 
uh, called the Diet of Worms. And this is one of my favorite Luther quotes in this debate. He says, I ask for the scriptures and, and Eck offers me the fathers. Kind of like what post-tribs do. They don't give you the scripture, they give you the church fathers. I ask for the scriptures, Eck gives me the fathers. I ask for the son and he shows me his lanterns. I ask, where is your scriptural proof? And he adduces, who? Ambrose and Cyril, a couple of church fathers. Luther says, with all respect to the fathers, I prefer the authority of the scripture. So that's why one of these solas, you'll notice the second one from the bottom is scripture alone. And if, if Luther had not stood completely and totally on the scripture by itself and had gotten wrapped up in what does Cyril say, what does Ambrose say, uh, what, do the, what do the popes say, what do the monks say, what do, what do the priests say. I mean, if he had taken the bait and gotten involved in all of that kind of thinking, uh, I don't think we would have the solas today crystallized for us the way we have them. And so Eck would quote, you know, Pope A, Pope B, and Roman Catholics will quote the popes because in their minds, the pope speaks ex cathedra, which means he speaks from the chair. That's why Roman Catholics think that the pope is what they call the vicar. Vicar means in the place of the vicar of Christ on the earth. That's why to a lot of Roman Catholics, they don't even know what to do with this Pope that they have now, who's basically a communist. If you read his encyclicals, he's basically promoting worldwide communism. Now, if you're a conservative Catholic, what do you do with that? You're just embarrassed because you can't contradict the guy because he's the vicar of Christ on the earth. So Roman Catholics are dealing with a base of authority that's totally different than Protestants. And our authority comes from 66 books. We like church fathers, but when the church fathers depart from the plain teaching of these 66 books, we depart from the church fathers. Amen? Roman Catholics aren't that way. That's why Roman Catholics come to different theological conclusions than you come to. Because they're dealing with a broader base of authority. They've also got to bring in a church tradition, which comes from the Pope speaking ex cathedra. So, you know, Eck would quote all of these church fathers in this debate, and Luther kept quoting the book of Galatians. And that's really what got Luther rolling on all of this stuff. Luther was one of the most... Um, uh, self-abasing men that ever studied for the priesthood. Uh, he put him, his body under these really abnormal constraints to the point, you know, where he was like walking upstairs on his knees, you know, to atone for his sins and all of these kinds of things. And this guy was so um, obnoxious, they didn't even know what to do with him. So they said, I know what we'll do with this guy. Let's just get him busy teaching Greek to our students because they recognized that Luther was a, a brilliant guy. And so he started teaching the book of Galatians from the Greek. And guess what he discovered? All of these monastic practices are not found in the book of Galatians. And that's why he started calling the book of Galatians Mein Frau, uh, which in German means my wife. He said, I'm wedded to the book of Galatians. So that's what's coming out here in this debate with Dr. Eck. Eck is quoting all of these monastic authorities and Luther is quoting what he called his wife. And he was saying, I can't find any of these Roman Catholic traditions in the Bible. So that history has to be kept in mind when post-tribulationalists want to move you back into a church history discussion. I mean, if the, if the debate is church history, probably we lose 
And probably the Protestant Reformation would have never even gotten off the ground. So my professor, J. Dwight Pentecost, puts it this way concerning post-tribulationalism. He says, if the same line of reasoning were followed, one would not accept the doctrine of justification by faith, for it was not clearly taught until the Reformation. And then I like this last sentence from Dr. Pentecost. He says, the failure to discern the teaching of Scripture does not nullify that teaching. The issue is, is it there? Not who has seen it there in terms of some kind of majority vote. Is it there? And if you don't have this principle at work, you don't have the Protestant Reformation. Um, I like what Paul says, and that's, that sounds bad too. I like what Paul says. Who cares if I like what Paul says? Paul says it. It's inspired scripture. It doesn't matter if I like it. In fact, there's a lot of things Paul says I really don't like, but God never asked my opinion on the matter. Okay. Paul, when he was completing his third missionary journey, went to a little port city called Miletus. And he summoned the elders at the church at Ephesus. And so it's a fascinating chapter by a shepherd, Paul, teaching shepherds, the elders at Ephesus, how to be elders. Because not too long ago, we're going to be asking you for some nominations for elder or elders at Sugarland Bible Church. And that's part of the process that we go through here. So how would you even make an intelligent nomination? Um, Most people say, well, if they're successful in the business world, that makes them good elders. No, there's a biblical standard for eldership. And part of that standard you're going to see in Acts 20. Um, So you might want to read through that chapter, you know, before you submit a nomination of somebody. But Paul says to these elders, for I know that after my departure, in other words, after the death of the apostolic age, savage wolves will, not might, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. He's saying the church is going to have a terrible time after the apostles die. Because you're going to bring in all of these people that are going to try to draw away the disciples after themselves. And they're going to teach perverse doctrine. They're no longer going to be teaching the word of his grace handed down from the apostles. But, the, they're going to, but these are the savage wolves that are going to enter in after the apostles die. Now when Paul makes that statement he's telling us where our authority is to come from. You don't develop your authority on whether something is true or not based on church father A, church father B, church father C. Paul himself calls a lot of that stuff savage wolves. There are some things that the church fathers taught that you, we wouldn't even allow here in Sunday school at Sugarland Bible Church. Uh, one of their views was baptismal regeneration that a person has to be baptized in order to get to heaven. And a lot of prominent church fathers taught that. A lot of church fathers hated the Jews. Did you know that? They were anti-Semitic from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet. Some of the most reputable uh, acclaimed church fathers. One was named Chrysostom, who they called Golden Throat or golden mouth because of his ability to be an orator in the church. And you look at some of the things Chrysostom taught, and they were just blatantly anti-Israel, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic. So when Paul says, after my departure, savage wolves will come in, he's telling us, if you're going to develop something as true, find it in apostolic writings. Not in church fathers, who many of whom could be helpful, but Paul basically puts a lot of them in the category of savage wolves. And Paul here gives us a uh, authority through which you determine truth. Looks like our screen went out, guys, just to let you know about that. Um, 
so in essence, this is my response to, you know, post-tribulationalism. Post-tribulationalism is always trying to get you into a big discussion about the church fathers. And the first response to it is the issue is sola scriptura. Not how popular a particular view is in the last 2,000 years of church history. So let me take you to the second argument that they use. And you guys can't see that, can you? But I can see it. So what, what an unfair advantage I have here. But if you have a good memory, the second issue was, or the second response to post-tribulationalism's view of antiquity is, second, the notion that the earliest church fathers were universally post-tribulational is a highly debatable proposition. So basically what's being argued is hey, all the church fathers were post-trib. And my point is, well, number one, who cares? Because my authority doesn't come from the church fathers. But the second point is the post-tribulationalists have dramatically, and I mean dramatically, overstated what they think the church fathers have taught. The church fathers were not as post-tribulational as uh, post-tribs are making it sound. One of the things to understand about post-tribulationalism is it denies eminency. If you are post-tribulational, you cannot believe in eminency. And what is eminency? <clears throat> eminency is the idea that Jesus can come back in the next split second. That's what eminency is. Eminency is basically the immediate, any moment appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe Jesus Christ can come back in the next split second? And the reason you can believe that is because you're pre-tribulational. If the church is going to be raptured to heaven before any of the events of the tribulation period take place, then Jesus can come back in the next split second. Jesus can actually come back before this Sunday school lesson is over. And some of you are probably praying for that to happen. Now, if you're post-trib, can you believe that? You cannot believe in eminency if you're post-trib. Um, because you, you have to believe seven years of tribulation period manifest themselves on the earth first. Uh, if you're mid-trib, can you believe in eminency? No, you can't. In fact, I was just talking to a gentleman who is uh, mid-trib, basically, and I basically asked him, do you think Jesus can come back today? There you go. And his answer was no. Jesus cannot come back today. So this is important to understand because we are really the only perspective that teaches eminency. And what you start to discover as you move into the church fathers, that the post-tribs think are so significant, is the church fathers themselves believed in eminency. Um, we have taught that the rapture is imminent could happen at any moment. We have actually used that as one of our seven arguments as to why the church must be raptured before the tribulation starts. So as a Christian, you are not looking for the Antichrist, right? You're looking for Jesus Christ. You're not looking for the undertaker, you're looking for the who? The upper taker. Now, these other perspectives what you really discover about them is they're all worried about the Antichrist. They're buying guns and gold because they think that they're going to face the Antichrist. Now, is buying guns and gold wrong? No. I've got a couple of the two G's myself. I'm sort of a prepper myself. But it has nothing to do with my eschatology. 
It has to do with the fact that I'm living in a fallen world and things can go wrong. But there's a whole segment out there in the body of Christ that they're doing all of this prepping because they actually think that they're going into some, most, or all of the tribulation period. And post-trib denies eminency, mid-trib denies eminency, what's called pre-wrath rapturism, which is at the very bottom of the screen, that denies eminency. And one of the things that's very interesting about the early church fathers is they believed in eminency. They believed that Jesus Christ could come back at any minute. And if they held those views, they don't mix with post-tribulationalism, second from the bottom. So when Ladd and, um, I forgot the other guy's name that I quoted, Gundry, Ladd and Gundry just say the early church fathers, they all were post-trib. Are you sure about that? Because when I read the church fathers, they seem to believe in eminency pretty strongly. And eminency does not mix with post-trib. Eminency mixes only well with pre-trib. So J. J. Dwight Pentecost puts it this way. He says, the early church, these are the church fathers, the early church lived in light of the belief in the imminent return of Jesus. Their expectation was that Christ might return at any moment. Pre-tribulationalism is the only position consistent with the doctrine of eminence. Uh, Here's a quote I found from a scholar of church history named Jesse Forrest Silver. And he writes concerning his study of the apostolic fathers. That's the, the church fathers that followed the apostles. They expected the return of the Lord in their day. They believed that the time was imminent because the Lord had taught them to live in a watchful attitude. Concerning these uh, pre-Nicene fathers, Silver says, quote, by tradition they knew the view of the apostles. They taught the doctrine of the imminent and premillennial return of Christ. So the earliest church fathers, they believed that Jesus was going to come back and set up his kingdom it's what you call premillennialism. But they also believed that Jesus could appear at any moment. So the idea that he could appear at any moment only fits with pre-tribulationalism. It doesn't mix with mid-tribulationalism. It doesn't mix with post-tribulationalism. It doesn't mix with three-quarters rapturism. So this idea that all the early church fathers were post-trib, it's like, let's, let's hold the phone on that. Because I see an awful lot of eminency type teaching in the church fathers uh, that doesn't fit with post-tribulationalism at all. Now, did the earliest church fathers draw out prophecy charts like this? I mean, am I going to go back into the writings of Irenaeus and am I going to find a nice prophecy chart? Seven years, what's going to happen at the midpoint? Jesus comes back at the end, then the thousand-year kingdom starts. Are they going to have a nice arrow like we do of a rapture before the tribulation period? I mean, do they have a fully orb doctrinal system like that? No, they don't. Why is that? Because they did not have the luxury of sitting in an air-conditioned office or classroom and thinking about such things. Why? Because a nut job named Nero was on the throne and he was essentially taking Christians and lighting them on fire to illuminate his garden parties. He was burning Rome to the ground and blaming it on the Christians and he was financing the Colosseum where the Christians were thrown to the ravenous lions in the lion's den to the jeering fans. And this went on from the time of Nero, about A.D. 64, 
who launched the first formal Roman imperial persecution against Christianity. And this just went on and on for a long time through different Roman emperors until finally a guy named Constantine came to the throne, I want to say about A.D. 313, and called the whole thing off. And Christianity, with a stroke of a pen, went from being persecuted to promoted in the empire. So between A.D. 64, when Nero started doing this, until the time of Constantine, about A.D. 313, if you were a Christian, you were running for your life. You were just trying to survive. So you, you, you did not have the luxury that we have of in, you know, sitting in a free country. The country's still free last time I checked, right? All right, just want to double check here. I read some things on the news and I'm not sure. Maybe we're going back to the Nero days. But anyway, they didn't have the luxury of sitting in an air-conditioned building putting together theology and prophecy charts. Okay, That's why this argument that well, what do the early church fathers believe? The whole thing is silly because these are people fighting and running for their very lives. Hiding in the catacombs and other places. So... Even though that was the case, they still believed that Jesus is coming back to set up his kingdom, premillennialism. They didn't call it that. They called it kiliasm, from the Greek word of thousand, kilia, kiliaz, kiliaz, kiliasm. And they believed very strongly in the imminent return of Jesus. They thought Jesus could come back at any second to rescue them from their ordeal, which is a notion that doesn't fit with mid-trib, doesn't fit with post-trib, but it fits very nicely with pre-trib. So let me give you some examples of eminency in the writings of the church fathers. This is from uh, the second epistle of Clement to the Corinthians. Have you been reading that in your devotional time? The second epistle of Clement to the Corinthians those Corinthians were bad people. Not only did they get a bunch of letters from Paul, but Clement wrote them a bunch of letters too. Uh, but this is dated about A.D. 95 to 140. So this is post-apostolic age. And there's a line in it that says, Wherefore, let us every hour expect the kingdom of God in love and righteousness, because we know not the day of God's appearing. So they apparently, Clement apparently taught that Jesus can come back in any second to set up his kingdom, which is not what you get from the teachings of post-tribs who think you've got to go through the tribulation period first before being raptured. Um, here is another statement from something called the Didache. Uh, by the way, don't pronounce that did, the Didache. I was talking to one of my friends on the phone and he kept calling it the Didache. And no, that's not pronounced the Didache, it's the Didache. All right, I'll slap your hand with a ruler when you come up afterwards. The Didache, Didache means teaching. The Didache is basically a manual of running churches. And it's kind of interesting in the Didache, there's a provision in it for baptizing children. Now, why is that interesting? Because you've got John, John MacArthur and all of these Reformed theologians saying you shouldn't baptize children. Why? Because we don't know if they're really submitted to the Lordship of Christ first. We've got to see, once they profess Christ, if they're going to go away to college and depart from Christ. So there's a whole mindset in the Reformed movement that you don't baptize children. And it relates to their Calvinism and the perseverance of the saints. And I just think a belief like that is insane because Jesus was around children all of the time, wasn't he? Let the little children come unto me, suffer them not. And there's actually a provision in the Didache about baptizing children. So if not infants, but children. So if we want to get into a discussion about church history... You know, why can't I use that to counter your reform beliefs? Uh, 
on that topic like you're using it to counter my beliefs in pre-tribulationalism. Anyway, that's just a sidebar. All right. So the Didache says this, watch for your life's sake. Let not your lamps be quenched, nor your loins unloosed. That's a good sermon title there. Let not your lamps be quenched, nor your loins unloosed. Be ready, for you know not the hour in which the Lord will come. What is that? That is eminency. That's he can come back at any second. That doesn't fit with mid or post-trib or three-quarters rapturism. Uh, Here, notice the date, the epistle of Barnabas, a very early document, AD 70 to 135, and Barnabas writes, for the day is at hand on which all things shall perish uh, with the evil one. The Lord is near and his reward. So the Lord's coming is near, it could happen at any split second and his reward is with him again that moves us in the direction of eminency which does not fit with post-tribulationalism at all now here is a statement that all of the anti-pre-tribulationalists wish they could kill destroy and bury forever because it's a fourth century to sixth century a.d document And as God is my witness, if I were to cover up the name on that, you would think Charles Ryrie said that, you would think John Walvoord said that, you would think Ron Rhodes said that, you would think Norm Geisler said it, you might even think I said it as pre-tribulationalists, but none of us said it. A guy um, named Ephraim in Syria He's called Ephraim the Syriac, and he's called Pseudo-Ephraim because most people don't believe this was the real Ephraim. It was sort of common back in this time period to attach your name to someone famous to add credibility to your work. So there's, there's for example, we have the books of 1st and 2nd Enoch, We don't believe Enoch wrote those, but someone attaching the name Enoch to their writings wrote that. So that's generally why he's called Pseudo-Ephraim. But Pseudo-Ephraim gave this sermon, and it was discovered recently and had to be translated. And it says this, Why therefore do we reject every care of earthly actions and prepare ourselves for the meeting of the Lord Christ, so that he may draw us from the confusion which overwhelms the world. Oh, so back in the 4th to the 6th century, he was talking about a time of confusion which is coming upon the whole world, and God's people were going to be drawn from that time of confusion. And what else does he say here? For all the saints of the elect of God are gathered, what does it say here? prior to the tribulation period that is to come and are taken to the Lord lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. Again, if you covered up the name, you would never think some guy said that in Syria back in the 4th to the 6th century AD, but that is what has been uncovered. A very clear, to me it's crystal clear, Not post-tribulation statement, not mid-tribulation statement, but a very clear pre-tribulational rapture statement. And once you start seeing things like this, you start to understand why Dr. Tim LaHaye started the group called the Pre-Tribulational Rapture Study Group which I am a part of, I'm actually on the, on the board of it, and we meet every December to talk about things like this. Because our experience is the view of pre-tribulationalism is not being defended anymore from the institutions that once traditionally defended it. In fact, many of our mainline schools are sort of embarrassed by it, and they're trying to walk away from it. 
So what do you do if you want to defend it? Well, you've got to form another group to, def to defend these kinds of things. And Thomas Ice, who's done a ton of work on this, believes that there are somewhere between 35 to 36 statements like this that anchor the pre-tribulational rapture at different times in church history long before John Nelson Darby in the 1800s came upon the scene. See, everybody says it was Darby that invented this and foisted it on everybody. No, Darby popularized it, but it's taught in the Bible. And because it's taught in the Bible, there are many statements like this that articulate it. Now, is it a majority view? No, it's not a majority view in church history. But if you know where to look and you're sensitive to the things that are being translated, you can start to see pre-tribulationalism in these different things. So when George Ladd and Robert Gundry say pre-tribulationalism is to be rejected because the pre-Augustine church fathers all believed that they were going to see the Antichrist before they were going to see the, the kingdom of God. You can see that he's just made, um, both of them have just made tremendous overstatements. And what did Goebbels say? If you repeat a lie long enough, people will what? People will believe it. And so the, the propaganda lie that you hear all of the time is the preacher rapture, that came about in the 1800s. Nobody ever believed that prior to the 1800s. And I'm trying to explain to you why that is not true. The third response to post-tribulationalism's appeal to antiquity is this prophetic truth is designed by the Holy Spirit to become more progressively understandable as the world reaches the allotted time period when the prophecies will be fulfilled. And this is a doctrine that I call progressive illumination. I want to be very careful when I talk about this. I'm not talking about progressive revelation. There is no revelation today from God of such a caliber that you could add a 67th book to your Bible. When John finished writing the apocalypse, the revelation of God in that sense ceased. That's why Jude tells us that truth has been once for all handed to the saints. This is why John, in the book of Revelation at the very end, says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book that if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life, from the holy city, which are written in this book. I mean, the Bible's pretty dogmatic on this, that God stopped speaking in terms of authoring books of the Bible back in the first century. And you need to understand this because not if, but when the Mormons come to your door. Two nice-looking men, well-dressed, riding bicycles. Don't turn the sprinklers on them or anything like that. You can be hospitable and nice, but what they will basically get you into a discussion about is, oh, oh you believe the Bible. Oh, isn't that nice? But the problem is you don't have the completed Bible. You just have a piece of it. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, Jesus made a appearance in North America. By the way, even though there's no archaeological evidence for it, Brigham Young University has the greatest archaeological department academically anywhere, and they themselves can't find any archaeological evidence for their own religion. 
you go to the land of Israel and almost every time someone puts their shovel into the ground, some new archaeological find is unearthed to corroborate the Bible. But the Mormons basically believe that Jesus made an appearance here in North America, I don't know, 1600s, 1700s, something like that. And there are these other books that came out of it, which are the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine of Covenants. So you take your Bible and you add to it three other books and you'll have everything that God says. Never mind the fact that those three other books, not only do they contradict themselves, but they contradict this book, teach different doctrines. So how do you respond when you get this invitation from Mormons? Well, the response is very simple. Jude 3 says, truth has been once and for all delivered to the saints. And Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, is very clear that God is not authoring Scripture anymore. So what you're involved in, even though you're very young and nice looking and you have a suit on and you do all of these humanitarian works, what you're involved in is a cult. You say, well, what's a cult? A cult is a group that claims to be Christian but it denies the essential truths of Christianity. Not the least of which is the fact that revelation has ceased. Now, although revelation has ceased, the understanding of it increases, particularly in the area of prophecy, as you get to the time period when the prophecies will be fulfilled. That's what I mean by progressive illumination. Not progressive revelation, but progressive illumination. As you get closer and closer to the time period when God's prophetic program will be fulfilled, what he starts to do is he starts to peel back veils that were there before that prior generations could not see. But you see it because you're living in the season when these things could happen. Now, if progressive illumination is true, and next time I'm with you, I'll try to convince you that it is from the Bible. If progressive illumination is true relative to prophecy, why in the world Would I get wrapped up in what Ambrose taught and Cyril taught and John Calvin taught in the area of eschatology and Luther taught in the area of eschatology? Why would I get embroiled in that kind of conversation when those guys, of course they had eschatology wrong because they're living in the wrong season of the Lord's return. See that? So that's where we're going to go next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, your truth, and helping us to navigate through these different rapture views so that we can uh, live for you correctly in these last days. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Happy intermission.